Hey everybody, welcome to a conversation on what's your favorite flavor of seltzer. Just kidding. Today we're going to talk about a completely non-controversial topic in craft beer, kids and breweries. A couple of months ago, someone posed a question to me. I'd love some ideas and advice on how to handle new age parents that want to free range their children while drinking in our tap room. We turned it from a secret hopper conversation to a CBP post and all of you listening probably were tuned in and everyone today had engaged in some capacity. Now today, we're going to talk about knowing your identity, your stance on children and breweries, and dive into strategies for success, lessons learned, and how to maximize the experience for everyone in your tap room. But first, let's meet our panelists and please share a little bit about yourself, your brewery, and also your stance on children and tap rooms. There's going to be plenty of time to dive in deeper. And Jennifer, you get to go first. Hi, I'm Jennifer Bach. I own Bach Family Brewing in Centerville, Ohio. Um, we are four families in our brewery. It's right in our name, Bach Family Brewing. Uh, we are family owned and operated, and we're definitely four families of breweries. Awesome. Jennifer, thanks for being here. Danny, you're up. Hi, I'm Danny Sample. I'm owner of Saloria Brewing in Alabaster, Alabama, and we have been very family friendly, uh, but we've had a few incidences that is causing us some concern. And uh, we felt this was a great forum to be able to talk about what we're doing so far and where we're going forward with it. You are a late addition, Danny, but I think it's going to be great having you here today. Jeremy, your turn. I'm Jeremy. I'm the owner of uh, Flounder Brewing Company in Hillsboro, New Jersey. Uh, we are a family-friendly brewery, but we uh, try to impose some, uh, impose some pretty strict policies on uh, what the kids can do and not doing stuff just so that all the guests can have a great experience when they're here. Awesome. Now, Abigail, you're up and you're in Wisconsin, so I hope we get to meet at CBP Connects Milwaukee this June, but back to you. Yep. So my name is Abigail Malcolm. My husband and I own Zambaldi Beer in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Um, we are in a suburb of Green Bay, uh, Alloway, and it is a family uh, neighborhood, and we lean in hard to being family friendly at our brewery. Last but not least, Casey, you're up. I'm Casey with uh, Four Noses Brewing Company, as well as Wild Provisions Beer Project and Odd 13 Brewing, all of which are in Colorado. Uh, all of our breweries welcome families. However, uh, some of them I just have a more of an adult atmosphere, not a place that you might choose to bring your child. Certainly everyone's welcome. We get families in all of them. And then the one of those breweries is very family friendly, everything from coloring pages and games and all that fun stuff. Awesome. Well, everybody, this is going to be a great conversation. We're going to try to tackle all the questions that come in the comments as well, but we hope you take away some valuable insights from this. So for everyone today, when did you first decide you needed to take a stance on children in your tap room? And if you decided you were pro-child, you know, why is being family friendly, being family friendly an important market for you? And Jennifer, we might as well start with you because you've got lots of family involved. I do. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, we decided we were going to be family friendly from our get go. Uh, we purchased a brewery that had actually went under and they were a family friendly establishment. Um, they weren't around for very long, just about a year, actually, uh, before we purchased them. And uh, we wanted to keep that uh, vibe going. Um, we actually upped the vibe uh, as far as being family friendly as we, we have an eight year old. And I think as an owner, you decide what kind of owner you're going to be, you know, I, I feel like, and I don't know if this is true and all of you can definitely comment on that. Um, you know, if you're an owner with small kids and you take your small child to breweries anyway, you're probably going to want to be a family friendly establishment yourself. Um, so we started off, you know, being family friendly from day one. Um, we do have lots of games. Um, some of them are free to play. Some of them are pay to play. Um, we have kids craft events in our breweries. We do have things like juice boxes and, uh, you know, kid friendly snacks. And um, we do have some signs around that say, you know, please pick up after yourself or take a game to your table and sit down to play it. Don't, you know, obstruct the walkways. Um, and then for the games that are more adult oriented, like pool or darts, we have um, items behind the bar where an adult has to come and retrieve those things to play the game. But um, we've always, you know, wanted to encourage, as um, Abigail is in a suburb um, that's a really family centric, um, we are the same. We are in a very young, like, family um, suburb of Dayton, Ohio, and we just wanted to make sure we were not missing that market. Yeah, for, oh, for, for us here, it, uh, I'm a father of 10 year old twins. Uh, so when I was starting up the brewery, 
just about 10 years ago when they were born. Um, we're used to taking our kids to breweries. We're used to taking our kids out. Uh, so we always knew when we expanded just recently two years to about a, a with indoor outdoor, about a 250 person capacity uh, tasting room uh, that we were going to be family friendly. But we wanted to make sure we also just appease the ones who may not want kids around and stuff like that. Um, so we really try to always I wanted to try to create a vibe that was going to be family friendly, but with supervised behave children. I think a lot of people can agree that it's the wonderful coin term of the free range children is is where we've had to get a little bit stricter because um it, it seems that that occurs a little more often but we also you know i also realize that a huge market is um the younger market than me i'm 46 i'm um, actually today 46. Um, happy birthday so, jeremy <laughs> thanks um so you have this market that's 20 30 the millennials who have new children those are the toddlers you're seeing coming in that's a generation that was used to coming in to breweries in general. They grew up with, they turned 21, breweries are already a thing and and now they have their children. And I think there's that expectation that they can continue to do what they do, which is great. And we welcome that. We just try to implement things in, that I know we'll talk about um, to to curb some of the, the chaos that can ensue if things aren't reeled in. We'll get there, I promise. <laughs> Um, I think Jennifer and Jeremy made really good points. I think when you've got little kids, you see it very differently. I mean, my husband and I both tell stories about changing our children as they were babies on the floors of tap rooms because nobody had changing tables. So we definitely from minute zero knew that we wanted to be child friendly, family friendly. We've got changing tables uh, in both the men's room and the women's room and just want to do things to make a make people feel welcome in your tap room because isn't I mean, it's all about hospitality and making people feel welcome. Um, even if they have kiddos, we also have rules posted that, you know, please pick up after yourself and be respectful and, you know, please keep an eye on your kiddos. But um, I don't know about the rest of you, but as a mom of a seven-year-old boy and a nine-year-old little girl, nobody needs a beer by the end of the weekend more than parents with young children. Because hmm? sometimes those weekends get real long, especially in the Wisconsin winters. Yeah. Um I think as a, I have a parent, I'm a parent. I'm the millennial with uh, the toddlers right here. So I'm the, the four-year-old and the two-year-old and we love going to breweries and that's um, something we love to do. There are breweries that are more inviting and that I'm excited to go to. There's a, and that also kind of the atmosphere itself can kind of direct how you maybe should expect your children to behave. So there's a, a local cidery with a, a playground on site. You've pretty much painted the picture that the kids can run around and and do as they wish and that's pretty fun for us as parents um there's other places that i love to go to as a parent without my kids that i probably wouldn't bring my kids to whether those are in downtown denver and just loud dark crowded not much for the kids to do i still love going to those places and they certainly have a place and there's also places we go to that are just maybe too fancy you know you wouldn't bring your kid to a fine dining restaurant and let them run loose. So you might not bring them in the first place, but if you chose to, you'd certainly keep a closer eye on them. And so for us, each with each tap room being in a different community, we've kind of looked at what does that community need and want? And we don't have any rules saying you can't bring your kids. We don't have any nights you can't bring your kids. But if you come to one of them after five o'clock on a Friday, it's going to be very loud, dark. It's all high tops. It's shoulder to shoulder. I don't know where you're going to put your kids. So we really don't have any. Another one's more like a fancy wine bar. You We get kids, but they're they're seated. They're behaved. The parents don't want them to run far. I don't have to have any rules saying posted saying your kid has to be within his arm's reach and um, any of that stuff. It's not we don't have to post it because it's uh, somehow insinuated by the environment how you should expect to behave. Our other breweries in a neighborhood, uh, nothing but families. So we got Lego table, we've got, um, yeah, a little different environment and we love it. If we didn't have those families, we wouldn't be selling very much beer. Casey, I love your perspective on this because based off all the tap rooms you help with, it has such different vibes and you know it provides insight to both sides of the coin. Yeah, we have, we have another one coming and I can't wait to see what that crowd's like. I don't know yet um, and we're gonna lean into it, but. You know, the place that I like to hang out, to be honest, is like my favorite ones are the less family friendly ones. Even though I have kids, I've got this picture here of me with my kids at the brewery, you know, but um, sometimes I, you know, sometimes I don't like my kids. <laughs> there is a time and a place. Danny, how about you? So for us, we are a neighborhood brewery. Uh, so we do have a lot of, uh, 
young families, like you said, the millennials. I think uh, Jeremy said it with the uh, free range kids. I don't know if it's coming out of COVID or what, but uh, we we tried to focus on family friendly with our trivia nights and our bingo nights. And then the families come in, they sit around at the tables. Uh, but we started having posting rules. We do have a large beer garden out back. Uh, we put AstroTurf or artificial graph, grass, I guess you could say artificial turf is back in my day. Uh, but the, uh, the turf came from old football fields or old multi-purpose fields, so they're striped. So they automatically think it's a, a place to play football. Um, and so we had to post rules about, uh, you know, one of our rules is, you know, play with your balls at home. Don't bring them here. And it, uh, it got to where after coming back from CBC, we finally decided we're going to have to set an age limit for being out back because of the free range mentality. There was parents inside playing bingo and said, hey, y'all just go outside and play. Well, when our when I have customers out there that have a fear of a football knocking over their beer or they get into areas that has a do not enter sign, but they just don't read them or they don't read the posted rules. We decided to hit out on social media and say we love families. We want everybody to know we're family friendly. We have grandparents coming in with their kids and their grandkids. So we have three generational families coming and joining a beer and a food truck and, and games or even the live music. Uh, we even toyed at one time saying, OK, after eight o'clock, no one under 19 or, or under 21. Um, but then we it gets that whole try to measure your balance of what customers are happy about it, what customers are upset about it, how can you work that balance? So our, our tap room only holds 80 on the inside on a five barrel system, but we have a large enough out back to, as the Alabama summers come about, they'll be a little bit warmer, but uh, it, we try to just expand it for families to enjoy, but that same token, we hope people respect that it is our business it's our livelihood and one small mistake. Uh, it's like I tell everybody, we were an inch away from losing our business last week. And I just, uh, we just had to step up and say, parents, please help us and uh, kind of watch for us. We're gonna dive into that story shortly, Danny, but you also mentioned you set expectations on social media and through your messaging. I think that's so important. And we're gonna dive into, you know, setting those expectations that you can on platforms like social media. And after that, we're gonna dive into setting expectations upon arrival. So I'd love to hear from all of you on how do you put it out there in your marketing, whether it's social media or otherwise, what people can expect when they visit your tap room. Jennifer, I'd love to hear from you on this one. Yeah, um, we, uh, I mean, pretty much all I do now, I feel like is on being on social media and advertising our events. Um, I've kind of come into the role of, I, I run our entire front of house at our brewery um, and I do our, our, our event coordinating and our staffing and all of that front of house manager, all that stuff. And um, one of, I feel like my main job is like event planning now. And I do that around being family friendly most of the time. Um, we've got trivia on Thursdays and we have live music every Friday and Saturday, but we also close at 10 p.m. Um, except for Fridays, we close at 11 and that's the latest that we're open. So I think, um, you know, when we're posting, we're saying the live music is seven to nine because um, that's like a good time for us where if you are a family, you can still come out and it's not too late. Um, but if you're not a family and you want to come out and um, enjoy live music, that we hope that any, every, any and everybody would be able to, to do that, given the time frame that we have made those events. Um, our kids craft days are about quarterly, and we do, do those on a Sunday from 2 to 4 p.m. Um, so they're nice and early, um, but they're after maybe, you know, church or, you know, before family dinner. Um, so it's kind of right in the middle of you know, you've got a couple hours to kill um, before you're going from, you know, one chore to the next or however it may be. Um, but on our posts for those kid craft days, we, I mean, they are paid days actually. So parents are coming in with the expectation that there's going to be a lot of other kids there. And we've had anywhere from 25 to 50 kids in our brewery at one time. Um, so it can be a lot of children. 
but um, I actually run those events myself. Um, and my mother-in-law named this, uh, like Crafty Carol that day. Um, she actually mostly creates all the crafts for us. And then I am walking around interacting. I'm normally dressed up like a princess or a superhero. And um, I am actually engaging with the kids myself um, and keeping them in line that way. I'm, I, I kind of act as their preschool teacher for two hours. Um, but that's something that I'm, I volunteer to do. Um, and I do enjoy it. I think it's a lot of fun. But um, on our posts, you know, it's it's me as a princess saying, this is what this is going to be like today if you come into the brewery. If you don't like children and brewery, maybe don't come in between 2 and 4 p.m. You know, you even blatantly say you might not want to come in between 2 and 4 p.m. Or, or is that I don't. Words? Yeah, it's pretty much implied. Like, you're not going to want to do that because there's going to be a lot of kids, um, you know, and they're not running around. I have them sitting down, you know, doing a craft, um, but we do play games. So there's a point in time where uh, we are, you know, playing an interactive game with them being, you know, pin the tail on the donkey, or I have this like superhero game that we play where they, um, you know, there, there's like a little bit of running around involved, but it's in a particular spot um, and not like entire, like the entirety of the brewery. And I think having like an 80 seat capacity brewery versus we're 150 inside, but we don't have any outside space. Um, so I think like your space also kind of can dictate like what you want to do in your brewery and outside of your brewery and how, you know, you're making sure how you're posting about that. Cause we say, well, we have like two tables outside. Um, you know, so it's like, if you want to have a nice quiet adult conversation, have a seat on our patio um, during two to four, but inside it's going to be a little, a little crazy that day. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Jennifer. Casey, I'd love to hear, you know, how you use your brewery social media to set those expectations. Sure. I'm always um, a smarter, someone smarter than me, um, Betsy Lay, that you're friends with. Um, we talked about how do you influence who comes to your brewery and people will go somewhere that they see themselves. And so if you post pictures of, uh, women or people of color, you've now shown those people, this is a place that you're welcome because we've posted, you know, these photos and it probably goes the same way with families. If you post pictures of families enjoying a beer, then you're probably going to encourage those, those different, those crowds. Um, if you show people in a crowded environment, maybe less so. And if you show people drinking beer out of wine glasses and perones and stuff like that you've also kind of uh, set a tone for atmosphere but you know being that we're not really none of us are really trying to go out of our way to attract children like jennifer's brewery um uh, you're just not going to see a lot of that in our social media it's mostly mostly products and then people um but it's but it's all adults now let's dive into setting expectations once you arrive you know jennifer and casey you've done a great job of talking about how you use your social media to prepare people for that experience but looking at when they show up at your brewery, say they've never been there before, you know, how do they know what they're about to get to? Are there rules posted? Are they going to see an event calendar? Me walking to your tap room for the first time, how am I going to know your stance on families and what to expect? And Jeremy, you've got something to say. Yeah, yeah. So we that's where we uh, we try to be proactive as much as we can to set the tone and the expectations that we have for for anybody coming in, uh, particularly here, we'll talk about families, but the same goes for uh, if people have dogs or if it's a large group that didn't rent our private space and they show up for a pop-up 25 person birthday party. Um, we do have signs posted everywhere that have a couple of generic policies that are important to us. And one of them is that children need to be at your table, seated with you at your tables at all times. So in other words, you gotta supervise your children. Um, they can't be running around the tap room, just like if you went to a restaurant, you can't let your kids hop up and run around all over the restaurant. But they can be with you and you can have a good family time together. Um, we have a whole wall of board games so they can pick board games. Um, but we also greet guests that we just want to emphasize some of these policies too. So it's more of a proactive approach instead of having something that might escalate later. Um, and we've seen that actually reduce the amount of interactions we've had that were negative. Um, where so if somebody comes in, we greet them, we help them get seats and we just say, hey, but just to let you know for everybody's safety, um, children can't be running around. They need to be seated at your table, um, particularly because we're located on a 19 acres of mixed use farm property. Um, it's not safe. It's you leave our premises. It's somebody else's premises right past our gate. And because it's that setting, 
um, people can assume they can just let the kids run across a busy public road to go see the horses that are on the other side of the street, unsupervised. Um, so we try to be proactive with that initially, and that, that seems to help immensely. You always have the exceptions. Um, but we also do the signage around, which is at all of our entry points and stuff, so that if we do have something that escalates later, we at least have something to point to, like, hey, you know, this isn't news to you. This is this is what we're what we do. This is what's posted, um, and that kind of gives staff making sure they have their their notifications that they can fall back on when they're when they're discussing with somebody. But we try to set a a positive tone of what of of for everybody's enjoyment at the beginning, and it seems to work for us for ninety nine percent. Jeremy, I think all of us probably know that the guests isn't always the best at reading sometimes, whether it's oh, the yeah. signage or, you know, maybe even a menu that they completely miss. Yeah, we do put any, that up for our use. Are like, there any tips that. Yeah. that you've found with your signage to make it more visible, attractive? You know, is there anything that you've seen successful? No, they, it, I mean, at our bar, there's two signs. One of them is in New Jersey, we have some odd laws. And one of the laws is that you have to have a material interaction with, a bartender before you can have a drink at a brewery. Um, so we use that as a 30 second elevator pitch of what's awesome about us, but you have to have this tour requirement it's called. So we have a sign that's right on these two beams that come down in our bar. There's a sign that says, everybody in your group must come up for a tour. And right underneath that is the miners need to be seated at your tables at all times. So they are literally at people's sight lines and nobody reads them. Um, but again, it's, I look at it more as all the signs that are around and things like that as, as tools for our team so that when they do need to approach somebody, it's not like, yeah, because people will still accuse us of, well, you should have told us. Well, we did. You just chose not to read the sign. Um, so when you get those people who want to be combative, sometimes it also feels good when you can easily point to something that shows you did tell them you just chose not to read. So we never found a magic cure for getting people to read. This stuff. Just more signage, keep it at a place where they hopefully will see it. Yeah, and and I can't say it doesn't do anything because for all we know is maybe there's a lot of people we didn't have issues with because they actually read the signs, you know, so we don't know that. And I'm not going to do the experiment of taking it all down <laughs> and seeing if it goes up. So. <clears throat> so everyone else, you know, how are you setting these expectations upon arrival? Jennifer? Um, well, I think one of the I was just going to allude to one of the comments here was, do you um, ask when you're providing, do you provide your staff with language to use when approaching parents who seem to not be paying that much attention to their kids and probably not reading their, their, uh, the signs that you have, you know, clearly posted. Um, and I've actually gone to like colored paper, like bright pink colored paper, um, to see if that would help. And yeah, Jeremy's right. Like you don't, you don't actually know. And we've been lucky enough, um, fortunate enough, un unlike maybe Danny's situation where we haven't had any like major issues. We have had people come in and be like, wow, this place is too family friendly for me and I'm not coming back. And it's like, well, can't make everybody happy. Right. Um, but when we, um, when our, you know, these parents are not paying attention to their kids or, you know, failing to read signs, um, we have trained our staff to be like, you are allowed to be stern with these people. Um, you know, it is a, a clear expectation. Um, I think just as a general human being parent that I'm not allowing somebody else to babysit my kids um, when I go out. That is not the point of that. This is not their school or a playground or whatever it may be. Um, so our staff is trained to say, you know, I, um, you know, I've noticed and we, we make it sure that they are actually like pointing out something in particular. Like I noticed your child is chucking down a shuffleboard puck and it flew off of the table because they're, you know, they're doing it too hard or they failed to put money in the shuffleboard to make the little pins go down. This is unsafe for everyone around. Uh, you know, we just simply ask that uh, you either put money in the shuffleboard, you know, we kind of give them, this is what happened. Here's what you need to do to fix it. And if not, here's the consequence for that. And they're all definitely trained to do that. Um, we don't give them like specific language, but it's got to be like kind of a but for situation. And that way people are not feeling super defensive, um, you know, when you're when you're speaking to them. Well, thank you, Abigail. Yeah. So um, I think empowering your staff is exactly right, Jennifer. I know our staff was struggling a little bit. So we do these Sunday family fun days where we really promote it. Come out, have fun. We do soda flights for kids. We go as far as having a balloon artist one week and face painting another week. And so it's really family fun, 
uh, friendly. We do craft kits. And so, I mean, it is definitely a serious family vibe, but our staff was a little unsure on how to deal with kids who were not following the rules, who were climbing on picnic tables, who were throwing stuff around. And so going through it, especially with our staff who didn't have children and who were a little greener in the hospitality industry and just letting them know that I always liken it to you wouldn't let a drunk person or somebody who's had one too many beers behave like that in your tap room. You shouldn't let the tiny humans behave like that in the tap room either. So you need to ask the kiddo if they're old enough to have that. Hey, buddy, you need to stop running in the tap room. And otherwise you go to the group and let them know the expectations. And we just like Jennifer painted in a safety standpoint, like, hey, we'd, we'd hate to have anything happen to little Johnny. So it's really not safe for anybody to be running in the tap room. And no parent wants their kid to get hurt because then you have to put your beer down and go and deal with Johnny who, you know, just hurt himself. So or you have to leave because now there's they're crying. So. And we've had really good success with that. And we, we really empowered our staff. Um, and we try to pitch it as a, it's a family day together. Initially, we were like, come to Zambaldi, you get a beer and your kids will be entertained. And our staff was like, could we change the wording on that? Because kids are just running amok and this is a tough day. Nobody wants to work Sundays. So we switched it to like, come spend the day as a family. Come grab a board game as a family. Play as a family. Everybody will be having fun as a family. And the vibe has really changed and it's been a lot less. Uh, so we really set the expectations in advance and we've had a lot less issues pop up. Abigail, I think that repetition is really important. Now, with regard to your experience, do you have any rules posted or any you know, guidelines that people read when they walk in? I mean, it's just like everybody, nobody reads anything, but we do have them posted and framed in our tap room. We have a chalkboard wall and a train table. We have a little kids area, which is um, kind of a throwback to like old school Wisconsin supper clubs there. Everybody had a bin of blocks in the coat room, usually in uh, supper clubs and bars. So the kids would usually kick it in the coat room. So in Wisconsin, it's always been pretty um, normal to bring your kids to a bar or a restaurant. Um but it's nice to be able to do something. But we do have it framed and posted by our chalkboard um, that says, you know, please keep an eye on your children. No running. Safety is our main concern. We want everyone to have a fun time at St. Baldy Beer. So it's posted. But uh, like Jeremy said, it's more so that our staff can be like, it was posted and you didn't see it. So this is now us reiterating it verbally to you. Now, Casey, you know, how does the design of a tap room influence? And you just spoke about it a little bit earlier, but I'd love to dive a little bit deeper how the atmosphere can help influence the vibe you aim to do put out there to your guests. Sure. You can ask any uh, parent when they walk into a place and they try and find that table. Where are we going to post up? Where's our base camp? And they're looking for low tops. They're looking for large picnic tables. They're looking for uh, couch areas where you're low to the ground and it's easy for your kid to get in and out of their seat um, and you just that's a pretty typical mindset of a, of a parent and uh, maybe not for everybody. And yet if you're getting off of work at the office and you want to go get drinks with your coworkers, uh, low tops aren't conducive to mingling. If, if we're half of us are going to sit, half of us are going to stand. We've been sitting all day and ha you're sitting at crotch height. It just is awkward, you know? Um, and so because, you know, the two of our tap rooms are in off or right next to office parks or in office parks, that after work mingling crowd is huge for us. And, half of them just want to stand up anyway. So we just, the high tops, I think makes a bigger difference than most people think. It were really the high tops really, intentional or were they just an added bonus when you realize oh, these are working out nicely? You know, when we opened the first brewery, I wasn't there, it opened, but it was nine years ago and before I even started. And I don't think there was any intent. It was just, this is where the kind of place we'd like to hang out at. And it was all high tops. Um, going forward, we've added some couch areas, low tops at the other tap rooms. Um, there's really not room in that first one for, more than the tables we have. Um, so it wasn't intentional, but gosh, did we hit a home run. People wanted a place to go mingle. We're in suburbia with nothing but box stores and chain restaurants. So having this kind of cool brewery was by all these offices was actually kind of a home run. And we're also, you know, coincidentally next to a lot of apartments with young adults. So big suburb, lots of families, but we're in this little pocket of people, young adults and offices where that just wasn't the app they don't want to go to that chain restaurant they want to go to something kind of cool and more vibrant and more adult um and so i think that's a that's a big one for us high tops versus low tops i think goes a long way do you want to bring your kid when it's this kind of high top um bar environment um i think glassware goes a long way too just having if you using stemware that might influence the atmosphere a little bit but yeah we're not huge on signs you know i don't think um a lot of people read them we do have one zone in our 
more family friendly brewery that is definitely where the people you know all the low tops of the couches and where all the um, families tend to go and so we have little signs right there they're not I don't love when you walk into a brewery and the first sign is don't do this don't do this don't do this I, I hate that feeling I want to be welcoming to everyone at all times and so try and avoid signs that say what not to do but it is nice when you have it somewhere you know if you have a little sign on your menu that says to go beer is not to be drank on site and then someone does it you can point I it, it says it right there you know so I do like what Jeremy said having something you can point to um is always nice but um and then I'll, honestly loud music you know what after a certain you know when it makes sense after a certain time it gets dark dim those lights crank up that music play some hip-hop um you can kind of set the tone that way as well a great insight there jeremy or casey i apologize now danny how about you how does the atmosphere help set the tone um well for us uh, when you first enter into the brewery it is a uh, you know the tap room experience there's high tops mixed with low tops we do have some seating and a stage for indoor music and then once you go outside as soon as you walk towards the beer garden we have a large basically a a two foot by four foot sign that kind of lists hey help us out with these things and it's some of it's directed at kids some of it's directed at dogs um you know it's almost the same of trying to tell someone clean up after your dog as much as it is, hey, don't have your kids throwing cornhole bags at each other. Um, and so our the question going back, and Jennifer hit it too, and so did Abigail, about the expectations with your staff and how your staff knows how to address an adult that may have had one too many. How do you give your staff the, the language and actually some of the authority if you're not there to be able to tell someone, hey, please stop, you know, because, uh, my wife and I are not always here, so they have to have the chance to know that we have their back when they tell us what happened. And so giving some empowerment to your staff and again, pointing to the rules. But uh, we also try to make sure our staff understands because we have the, the beer garden. They've got to make rounds and circles looking for empty glasses and checking trash cans. And uh, so that's where we try to the, what we've started now. I don't know if you can see over my shoulder, this shoulder, that's Roxy back there. And uh, so we started doing some social media with her standing by certain rules or certain things that we're doing. And it kind of gets a little eye catchy. Um, and uh, and it kind of helps in a fun kind of way and of, uh, of kids seeing that and customers seeing Roxy kind of help us uh, explain some expectations. Um, it, it's even... Uh, I know we're talking about kids and brewery, but uh, um, even trying to remind customers you can't vape inside. It's not so much our rule as it is our city's ordinance or uh, or the health department. So uh, training expectations of your staff uh, and giving them the empowerment to explain, you know, this this is a business. It's 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 not the outdoor playground down the park uh, at the park. Um, this past week was just a a huge example of one give the empowerment to the staff because of what was happening out back. Danny, what happened last week? Uh, so uh, we get back from CBC, everybody's in a really good mood. And as soon as we got back to our house, we got a text that said, I just had to tell a kid to get off of the cold room. So I have an outdoor cold room and a, a kid had climbed up on, took a bucket, went behind an area that they weren't supposed to be. We have all of the signs, Parents were inside, kids were told to go outside. And the thing is, these were not young kids. These were middle school kids. Uh, so we had a staffer that uh, saw a kid uh, start trying to climb. And then as we went to the tape, uh, we saw kids were throwing uh, cornhole bags at each other while their parents were inside playing bingo. They were throwing Jenga blocks when their parents were inside. Uh, they were tossing footballs. Um, I know I'm throwing myself out there as something that truly it could be your worst disaster happen with kids, but that's what prompted our, our social media post when we finally just said, you know, have to help us. Uh, and I try to tell people, you know, we could have been within inches of, of losing our business, our livelihood. And uh, we just felt like it was very strong incident that caused us to put out what some may have felt was stern language know some people thought we were you know very stern about about what we're saying even though we're family 
but please help us help, help you. Uh, but uh, it, it just it just really threw us in a, uh, I can't believe this is happening and we have to talk about this. Yeah, you were forced to take a stance publicly. Now, Danny, you know, in that post, I was reading the comments, it's interesting to see when part of your fan base is very pro children and breweries and part of the family, the part of the fan base is breweries aren't bars, don't bring your kids. How do you handle it when your audience disagrees on what you right. should be? So what we try to do, one, is is have a physical presence here. Uh, it, it's not throwing something out there and then walking away. Uh, by having a physical presence here as us as owners um, or having our uh, taproom manager be able to be there to try to help explain. Um, even walking out back and just explaining why. Uh, but most of our customers that do have children, it, it it's kind of that thing of a, a shotgun blast. If it doesn't apply, if it doesn't apply to you, you don't have anything to worry about. The ones that do have a concern about it, uh, I think it was Jeremy said something about a one-star review. We got a one-star review because we had to tell a lady that she couldn't use the emergency exit to go out to her car to get something, and she didn't want to bring her kids through the tap room. But it's like, I, you know, I've I'm, I'm got to follow the rules that the city and the ordinances and all that set forward. Why is it so hard for you to follow my rules? Um, and so our customers that are happy about what we put out there have uh, have been trying to hint to us, please try to help. And then the ones that do have kids are like, I cannot believe that parents are free ranging again or not trying to step up for their own kids and then feel embarrassed whenever one of our staff has to tell a kid the cornhole boards are not ramps to run up. And uh, so we're at, a, at that uh, more positive than negative right now. I think our, our post that we put on our Facebook page is probably our most liked post that we have done in our four years of existence. People like it when you lean in. Now, yeah. you know, we've talked a lot about empowering your staff. I think that's so important, but you know, you can empower your staff, but it's also extremely important. You train them and give them the tools for these interactions. How do you all prepare your team to deal with situations that aren't necessarily ideal when interacting with families and children? You know, what does that training look like in your brewery? Uh, I can go. Um, so we do weigh heavily on giving the team the empowerment to do what they need to do to make sure the thing we focus on most in any situation is how do we de-escalate something that's an escalation how do we not add to something that's going to be an escalation um so we actually empower our staff to the degree that like they um are again we're on a farm but we only lease the piece of land that our brewery and our outdoor patios is on and then there's a <clears throat> gate that leads out to a big back paddock of grass big open field that but it's not our premises <clears throat> and naturally you'll see some kids starting to run around play there maybe throw a frisbee maybe throw a football it's actually not our property um but our staff has the ability to make the decision whether they will actually escalate that into going and talking to the parents about hey they need to come and sit with you or to just keep it as a de-escalation where you know what no harm no foul um we're not publicly saying people can play out back there so we're not setting that expected vibe when you come here that it's a free-for-all back there so we give our staff that that ability to make those decisions whether they have to approach somebody or not is it really something that's going to be dangerous or not really an issue or not um but then the staff does have the authority of course just like you know the example of uh an intoxicated person that you got to cut off and get them in a lift to get them home um that's uh, that you can have people leave if they're not following our rules uh and but then that's always predicated with that we always have somebody here that's a lead whether it's me or my cousin the own one of the owners or one of our staff that's been with us for a long time who also act as managers so they ultimately have the final call um but everybody all the way down to our, our beer backs uh, have the authority to address a situation talk to it or give leeway in a situation it's not all black and white this is the way it is so for anyone else, you know, how are you training your team to deal with these tough situations? So we actually did role playing. Um, uh, we presented the team with the situations and I was like, okay, this is happening. What do you do? What do you say? And we started, I wanted to make sure that that language was still gracious and welcoming to them. But I mean, you can have stern conversations with 
guests at your tap room where everyone leaves feeling good, but your message does get across. So um, I've been in the hospitality industry for about 20 years, but some of our bartenders have been in it for six months. And so they just haven't had that many interactions with guests kind of corralling them. So I think role playing and just kind of playing out the language, um, you're never going to get down every situation, but you can kind of bucket them and make sure that they know what to say, make sure that they have the brewery's interest in mind, but make sure everybody leaves happy and wants to come back, but that the kids are being well behaved and everybody's enjoying themselves. No, thank you for sharing that, Abigail. Now, let's talk about something that I know you've done, Jeremy. You initially toyed with the idea of doing hours when children aren't allowed. Talk to me a little bit about that and tell me how it went. Uh, yeah, so we we did do that um, and we're going to continue doing it um, just for certain months. Uh, and the reason for certain months is um, we have 100 person capacity inside, but we have 21 picnic tables outside. So obviously we lose our outdoor seating in the colder months. Um, indoors on, especially on Friday nights, Saturdays, those hundred seats inside, they, they'll, they'll be packed. They'll, they'll be filled, they'll be standing room. Um, and at one point during the course of this winter, before we implemented no minors from November to March after 6 PM, um, you know, we had a group that took up, uh, it was four adults with, uh, before I said to her, but it was 14 children, um, from six o'clock to nine o'clock when the band was on and we're only open till 10. Um, but it was just one of those it wasn't it wasn't that we we're the kids were bad the kids were actually not bad it just took up an immense amount of seating and we can't sell kids snacks we can't sell juice boxes we can't we're only allowed in new jersey we're only allowed to sell the alcohol that we make uh the beer that we make that's the only thing we're allowed to have generating our revenue so it actually became more of a revenue issue than anything else um because we had a lot of people that came in that were adults wanting to drink on a saturday evening at the brewery and they left and went somewhere else um we did get the few messages on social media that, oh my God, you suck, you hate families, you do you have kids? Do you? And I'd actually say it was about two or three out of the hundreds of comments we got thanking us for that on a Saturday night. And, and eventually I took the posts down once we had put it up, not because it got negative or anything, um, but I just want to looming on our social media. Time went on, some people were getting nasty in comments. Um, when it became the no kids should go to bars anyway, um, that uh, we started to continue to get messages during the after we took that post down in our in our instant uh, in our DMs again still thanking us. I was actually surprised by the amount of positive that came from that, but because we did it in a way that we said we welcome families Saturday afternoons, we welcome families Sundays. Our hours on Sundays are twelve to eight, and it was mentioned earlier about again, just getting that message out and the tone out. So we're trying to set the stage that, you know, Saturday evenings are more, it's the 21, the 21 and ups, um, you know, when, when that music's here and, and we're packed with drinking adults. Um, and in the wintertime, it's shoulder to shoulder sometimes, and those adults are drinking. And there's, there's little Jimmy trying to squeeze through, get somewhere because the parents lost track of them and, and what happens, you know? Um, and it, it, it worked for us. We're gonna do it again come November 1 um when our outdoor seating basically goes away and i imagine you're pretty clear in your social channels of what to expect that time of year oh yeah and we actually have it because obviously on the website um but every social media post we do always has our hours below along with our hashtags our hashtags that we can copy and paste and one of them says next to our saturday hours so even right now any post on social media it says november 1st to march 31st 21 and up after 6 p.m on saturdays um and if if it becomes an issue again in the in the summertime or the, or the nice months, we'd have no problem doing it again. Um, we did not see any issue, any dip in revenue. I'm sure there might be some people who, uh, I don't know why when you're told, and again, this is coming as a parent, that you're not allowed to go here with your kids, you get offended. Um, and I'm sure we offended some people by doing that, but that's that's what we needed to do for our business. Um, and, and it worked and most people seem to be fine. We had a lot of families who said, oh no, that's great. We come during the afternoon anyway. Um, the, I mentioned before about like the millennial generation with the newer kids and stuff like that is a great market for us. Saturday is at 12 o'clock, one o'clock, two o'clock. There's a food truck on the farm here. We see a lot of those younger families, a lot of those new parents, and they're wonderful. The, it's a chance for them to get out with their kids that are maybe one or two or three years old. And later they're home because they're exhausted. Like when I was, when my kids were that age and you go to bed by eight o'clock. Um, but we have a place for them in that afternoon and stuff to come out and hang out. Um, and we don't want to alienate the, uh, those those good people like that. 
let's talk about something that everybody likes. It. Everybody likes money, right? Everybody in this room is open to business to be as successful as possible. So what have you seen as the impact of allowing families in your tap rooms and being more, you know, kid friendly with regard to traffic and spending Any unique stats or just observations to share? So our Sunday afternoons, especially in the darks of Wisconsin winters, were kind of dogs, um, especially November, December, January, if the Packers aren't playing and people aren't at home watching football, if they've got a different night uh, that they're playing, uh, nobody was coming out because the weather's gross. Um, so turning it into our Sunday family fun day made it huge. It's usually follows Friday night on sales. I mean, people come out, especially in the darks of winter um, on these family focused days. So it really helped with revenue. Um, and we are allowed to sell soda and juice boxes and snacks and we do pay uh art classes as well so we make some revenue off of uh like the paid programming for children as well but yeah we did find that it really helped our our weekly revenue and so it was for sure worth it for us we have the, the pretty much exact same approach as abigail's brewery does sundays were you know it still can be if, we, if there's nothing going on um you know pretty terrible so adding in those kid craft days that we have, um, which are paid, you know, pay, pay to play type of days. Um, it, it did the same thing for us. It really generated revenue um, similar to like a Friday night that we wouldn't have had otherwise. And our kid craft days include um, face painting, story time, um, a craft and games and a snack and a drink for the kids. So it's, it's like 12 bucks, but they get a lot of things for that $12. And um, it's it definitely definitely helped, um, but we do have like adult centric events as well, where it's like a ticketed event, and it's, you know there are you know kids under the age of twenty one are allowed, um, you know, and those those certainly help too. As we try to patronize to all of the you know to our guests that come in, um, but without having uh, and just on like regular days, um, like for our trivia topics, for instance. Um, I'll do Disney trivia and Pixar trivia and Marvel and Star Wars, and but then I'll have like, you know, 70s music trivia as well. So, you know, I try to like make sure our topics, even for things like that, are, um, you know, family oriented as well, where kids can also enjoy playing. Um, and our typical um, prize for any trivia would be like a gift card back to the brewery. But when I do the um, more like kid center, like, you know, Disney or Pixar, I'll have kid prizes as well. So I'm like specifically saying, hey, good job today, um, friend, you you did really well in trivia, here's a prize for you too. And that way everybody feels included. Awesome, now Danny, do you have anything unique on your menu that speaks to children? So what we did uh, is we have a local company uh, that does gourmet popsicles. So it's various flavors from caramel sea salt to birthday cake or anything of that nature. And of course, here in Alabama, you know, we've already hit the 90 degree tents uh, already here. And so having the, uh, the popsicles for the kids um, and we also make non-alcoholic root beer. And so in the summertime, we go and just get some small ice cream cups so they can have ice cream floats uh, along with, uh, you know, we'll have the kid have an ice cream float and dad has a stout float. Uh, so it, it kind of, provides a way for uh, the parents to interact with their kids, but it also kind of gives the kids something uh, other than just seeing bar taps. Um, and, and that's really turned into, I think we're actually the largest seller of the popsicles for this franchise uh, that it has it around town. Um, but those are some of those little menu items from uh, even a little bit of, uh, as much as you hate to say the candy, but you know, I don't care if I sugar them up here and send them home. But uh, having some of those uh, uh, pretzels and other things from the food truck, um, I think someone mentioned, I think it might have been Jeremy was talking about having the food truck. It's Saturday afternoons when it's not college football here in Alabama. You know, it can be a little slow on Saturday afternoons. But when we started doing uh, having crawfish boils or, or uh, just hooks, those are the things that families kind of enjoy having together and it's sitting down. Um, so those are the kind of things that we try to do to encourage with fans as well. 
I know I'm a lot like Casey when it comes to the two type of brewery experiences I want. There's sometimes I want with just fellow adults, and there's sometimes where I bring my family out on a Saturday afternoon. We're gonna have food. He's gonna have a popsicle, and we're gonna spend a lot of money on like oversized, you know, overpriced juice boxes and things like that. And you know, it's a great experience for everyone. And you know, funny, you know, a brewery was actually the first place my little one went to the bathroom in public, and it was a really proud moment for me. So these big things that you know, they happen at tap rooms, and I love the family friendly ones, but on the flip side of things, there are also breweries that take a stance and don't allow children. Casey, I believe there's a brewery in your area that does this. You know, what are the thoughts there? What, what have you heard about the experiences since? Sure. So there's three breweries in Colorado, the suburbs that I know that um, don't allow children at all. 21 and up. Um, it's in the news that one of them recently, there was a couple articles written about it. Um, but I'll give you two examples, but and I won't say names, but um, one of them is in a rural community. There's only two breweries in this rural community and there's a lot of families. They have a 21 and up policy. I'm not sure the reasoning or why they chose to go that route, but I can tell you their Google reviews are rough. Uh, it's one star review after one star review, like screw this place. They won't let me come with my baby. They won't let me come with my kid um, and so on and so on. And um, the other one is in a, suburb so very close to Denver and it's we're, we have so many breweries just breweries on every block it feels like so and there are a lot of them are family friendly and so they've said no kids and they've had the opposite reaction uh, their Google reviews are five star reviews over and over and over again about how I love that there's no kids uh, in the article they said um, once they made this move Sundays were always kind of a, a, a dog day for them if people especially during football season for us, actually people love to stay home and watch the games. And so, um, but they said once they made that change, not allowing kids, uh, their sales have gone up 30%. So they're getting, they're attracting people through this no kids allowed environment. And I think what's happening is they're in this place where there are so many options. No one's really offended. They can't go to the one brewery. There's 10 other options to go to. Like you said, Jeremy, it's surprising to be told you can't bring, to be offended, to be told you can't bring your kids somewhere. Um, it's a bummer when you go up someplace with your kids and you're excited and you get there and realize, oh, crap, we can't go in. That's never fun. We've got to put the kids back in the car seats, do it all over again. Um, but at least in that town, well, you're a short drive from several other options. Um, I think those in that rural community, <laughs> maybe they don't like the other brewery in town or they're a long drive from something else. So it's they're pretty bummed when they got the kids loaded up to go to the brewery. And honestly, you know, usually the kids are excited. I get the my kids are stoked to go to the brewery. So um, they'd be pretty bummed if we showed up and we had to turn around. But it's really interesting to see two different, the same policy, two different breweries and completely different reactions. Um, the one that is, has the positive reactions, I'll name that one. That's Odyssey Brewing. If you guys want to Google it and read the articles or um, read their the owner's opinions on it. Um, and th they have bad reviews. Sure. There's some in the mix. Um, and does the other one have some good reviews? Sure. But uh, really interesting to see two very different reactions. And like Jeremy, we didn't, we made a rule. It was during COVID. So we were very limited on capacity because we could only have so many seats and all this stuff. And a kid was a person. So we decided to not allow kids that every seat was spending money because the most important thing to us was at that point was money. So we could pay our employees and keep them working. Um, there was no higher priority other than making as much money as possible at that moment. And, uh, I'll always wonder if that was the right call, because if freeing up that one seat that one time to make an extra twelve dollars, you know, was was that worth it versus I've never seen some of those people come back. We told them they, their kid wasn't allowed and they've never come back to our brewery. So we missed out on all those return visits over the years uh, because of that one time we turned them away. And so I'll always question if that was the right call. It seemed like the right call at the time. Um, and some of our Google reviews showed people's displeasure with it. But um you know, those people, I'd wish those people came back and they probably never will. Yeah, thanks for sharing all that, Casey. I think you bring up a really good point. It really comes down to the brewery owners, you all, the managers, to set that vibe, set those expectations, and take the stance on what you want to be and, and just lean into it. Now, we're going to do rapid fire of two separate questions before we wind this up. The first question is, you know, as you try to figure out who you want to be with regard to being family friendly or lack thereof, is there anything you have tried over the years that did not work out as well as you planned and you have not done it again? Lessons learned here, everyone. 
I think one of you mentioned earlier, you know, just the messaging, Abigail, it was you. You've switched to like family friendly, family friendly. You'd spend your families here. It was just the way the wording you put out of your mission. I think that was very impactful. Yeah, we literally changed like two words on all of our social media posts being like, it's family friendly day. Come, the kids will be entertained and you can have a beer was what we used to say. And now we say, come spend the day together. And really yeah, I, okay. that changed it. Yeah, and I would latch onto that too, that we've learned over time to kind uh, for us it's being a little bit more specific on what we expect on what days so it kind of changed just how we market it so sundays are we do market more like bring the kids down grab the board games you know we emphasize that grab the board games and play with your kids um where saturday nights we never mention men talk about that for saturday evenings or when we're promoting music on saturday nights we aren't including pictures that have kids in it and stuff like that which casey had brought up earlier um so we kind of learn to be a little bit more specific in what vibe we want to set on what days I want to touch on a comment right now we just had in the thread. You know, how do you handle feedback on social media reviews about, you know, having too many kids in your tap room? Do you ever have like a stock response you put in there that's been successful or how do you kill them with kindness, so to speak? I can kind of comment on that because it is hard to, you know, decide whether or not you even want to comment. <laughs> um, sometimes things are are just not warranted and, in, in, you know, our we have to keep going back to, you know, we can't make everybody happy. And at the end of the day, it's just not going to happen. Um, so we kind of, it is like a little, little bit of a kind approach, but also, I don't know, I'd say it's in the middle, like, you know, we're sorry you didn't enjoy your experience. However, you know, family is in our name and we are a family oriented brewery. Um, and, you know, while I understand you thought this was, you know, too many kids in here, maybe come back on, you know, a Friday night at 9 p.m. and hang out from 9 to 11 and there's not gonna be that many kids in there. You know, so we try to, you know, say, sorry for your experience. However, this is who we are and we're not gonna change who we are for you one person um, and, you know, take it or leave it. Awesome, now as we wind down everybody, looking back on everything you've done to create the environment you want your brewery to be, what is a tip you would give to others to, you know, assert their stance or lack thereof on children and breweries? Like, what would that strategy, what would that tip be to others, you know, being challenged by this topic right now? I, I think prime, the number one thing is is you, you need to know what your personality of your brewery is. I mean, that's, that's just number one. You can't be everything for everyone. So you have to create what you want your place. You're always going to get some negativity in this world that we live in today. No one is ever going to be 100% satisfied, but it's it's your brewery. You know what you want. You know what the vibe you want. You know what the tone you want, whether that's extremely family friendly with the crafts, everything like that, or it's no, I want a place that's 21 and up and that's the way it's going to be. But you need to be clear from that at the beginning. I mean, the one thing we've had trouble with is these little pivots that we've had to do that I wish I did know more about at the beginning to try to set a, set a better tone at the beginning from the get-go. Um, but th that's the most important thing. Everything I think you've heard is everybody knows what their market is that they're trying to um, focus mainly on, but you don't want to ignore the other markets. So we all seem to also be, how do we adjust a little bit to, to bring in some of the other markets that may not be our main market? Um, but know who you are from the get-go and what you want to do because it's hard to backtrack later because that's when the negative reviews would pop their heads. Yeah, I think really clear positioning yourself. Uh, you walk into our tap room, it's a lot of glass, it's fairly industrial, but then you, the first thing you see is a kid's area. So it's pretty small, but it is right off the bat. Um, so yeah, we really just kind of lean into it. And I mean, we've definitely made adjustments. We've been open for three and a half years. Uh, in the beginning, we spent a lot of time and effort making homemade sodas for kids. Cause we're like, kids are going to love these. They're going to be incredible. Nobody cared. Um, they wanted root beer and they wanted cherry soda. So we work with a local fruit soda distributor. Um, so we have made some pivots and tried to make it you know, worthwhile and easier for ourselves. Our kids area used to have a ton of puzzles in it. And now it's got really big dinosaur toys, which are a lot easier for us to clean up at the end of the night, because I spend a lot of time doing puzzles. Um, but yeah, you just need to know who you are and position yourself and try to make everybody feel welcome. And you can't please them all, like Jennifer said. But, you know, I think we win a lot more than we lose being family friendly. Anyone else final thoughts? The one tip you would give to other brewery owners and managers to create the family or lack their vibe they're hoping for? 
Well, this has been a fun one. You know, there's so much. Danny, go ahead. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Oh, and I'm sorry for the delay. Uh, I, I, I think the expectation up front uh, to to set what you are, um, you know, we've all talked about kids. We've talked about being pet friendly as well. But having the expectation of being able to have a conversation with your customers, if it means sitting down at the table with a customer and explaining why we have to be uh, very strict on certain rules. Um, but it's got to be that communication piece of it, lead, lead by example kind of thing with your with your staff and, and also as an owner. That's kind of what we have to do. Awesome. Well, well, thank you for that. Now, Jen, I do have one final bonus question for you. You talked about, you know, the unique outfits you wear some Sunday afternoons. What can we expect you to be donned in this week? <laughs> Well, uh, this week we actually don't have any kids events. This week we actually have an Optimus Cup Club coming in. We have a 40th birthday party coming in. Um, so this this week I won't be in any costumes. But, yeah, come in and sometimes I'm dressed like a Viking and sometimes I'm Cinderella and sometimes I'm Captain Marvel. <laughs> you never, never quite know what you're going to get when you come in. Awesome. Well, Jennifer, Danny, Jeremy, Abigail, and Casey, thank you so much for sharing your insights and wisdom and suggestions and lessons learned today. This has been a really important conversation. Hope it was valuable for everybody listening. If anyone would like to reach out to any of you or reach out and follow your breweries, what's the best way to do so? And Jennifer, because we be began with you, I'll let you shout out first. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate it. This is a really interesting topic and it has set, like seemed to come up more and more often on our uh, in our feed. So I appreciate it. But yeah, if anybody has any questions, it's just Bach Family Brewing at gmail.com. You can uh, reach out to me. Feel free to email. Um, if you have any questions on like how we run our kids craft events, I'm happy to share any and every possible bit of information I have. Um, and then like the legality of it is um, something we didn't actually get to talk about, which was something I like was kind of hoping we would with just what you can do. Like Jeremy can't serve sodas and things in his brewery. And I thought that was like a really interesting thing. It's like, why, you know, um, it's, it seems crazy to me. Um, but you know, and, and then like the, we have a role here actually, and I know I'm getting off topic, um, of just like, um, you're not allowed to advertise to kids. So we had like, we, you know, like tread this fine line of the strict reading of the rule is this. However, like no one's following it and no one's getting in trouble for it. You know, so um, that that's like another like maybe topic for another day. But, um, you know, if any, I'm an attorney by day. So if anyone wants to reach out, I'm in Ohio. Um, feel free to do so at BachFamilyBrewing at gmail.com. Never enough time to tackle it all. Thanks, Jennifer. Danny? If anybody's looking to contact you or follow your brewery. Yeah, so you can uh, follow us on. Uh, so we're at uh, Slurry Brewing on. Instagram, and you can reach me at Danny at Solari. It's uh, I'm I'm finally retired out of my full time job and at the brewery full time now, so I'm easy to reach, and uh, it's uh, I'm always glad to talk and always share our fails more than I can our our successes because we all have to learn from our failures. And that's coming from an old army guy, but. Uh, I'd love to talk more about this topic. It does impact us both from uh, kids and from dog. Uh, so if anybody's had questions, please reach out to me. Or if you have any suggestions, I've got plenty of notes for everybody about what we're going to make some changes here. So again, thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks again, Danny. Jeremy? Uh, yeah, uh, there's one good point was about the legality. That, that does affect a lot of people's business models. Um, and I spent a lot of time in New Jersey uh, testifying in front of committees, trying to change our laws because we're only allowed to advertise 25 events a year and we can only have two TVs and some real nonsense. Uh, so, but if anybody uh, wants to reach out, uh, you can contact me at flounder at flounderbrewing.com. Thanks, Jeremy. Abigail? Yeah, uh, Zambaldi's got a pretty active Facebook page. So check us out at Zambaldi Beer. Otherwise, you can contact me at info at zambaldi.com. Thanks again for joining us today. And Casey, take us out. Yep, you can follow Four Noses Brewing, uh, Wild Provisions Beer Project, or Odd 13 Brewing all at their Instagrams. Uh, you can get to all of them at 4inbev.com and email me at hr at fournosesbrewing.com. 
And uh, yeah, the legality stuff's interesting. I think in Wisconsin, you guys can sell beer to minors provided they're with their parents. Or if they're a minor and married to someone who's of drinking age. Right. And Jeremy Whoa. can't even sell a juice box. So, we're, you know, always fun. Yeah. Isn't that a way to go out, everybody? We'll just stop there. So thank you all for being here today. Best of luck. Hope to share beers at some point. And don't hesitate to reach out to everybody who shared their insights today. So thanks again. Cheers, everybody. See you soon. Thank you.